Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of In the Barn. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we're going to be breaking down joint supplements. With several decades of research backing up these ingredients, we hope to answer the question, are these products doing anything? Hey guys, welcome back. This is our part two of the supplement industry. Like I said, we're looking at joint supplements today. And I want to warn you guys, we are about to go on a roller coaster. Like there is a lot of information going to be flying at you. So like wear a helmet (laughs) on this roller coaster or something because it's going to be dangerous. But also make sure that helmet is your biochemistry helmet because you're going to be learning a lot of like chemistry words. There's going to be a lot of science thrown out of you at you i had to google a lot of terms is what i'm saying um so i hope you guys enjoy this episode as i i went deep into the rabbit hole on this one way down deep in the rabbit hole and i'm i'm scared i am scared of the joint supplement (laughs) industry But to kick off or start the episode, I want to first define what a nutraceutical is because that's really the products we're going to be talking about. That's what supplements are. So a nutraceutical is something that is a non-drug substance that is produced in a purified or extracted form and administered orally to provide agents required for normal body structure and function with the intent of improving the health and well-being of the person or the animal taking it. Or basically, it's food containing health-giving additives. So it's a combination of nutrition and pharmaceutical, which is medicine. Uh, And most of these products are really going to be targeted at arthritis. So before we get too far into joint supplements, I do want to just talk about what arthritis is really briefly. If you want to know more about arthritis, straight from the Horse Doctor's Mouth podcast, Dr. Latcher has an awesome episode on arthritis. Go and listen to it. She goes through what it is and some of the different ways to treat it and help manage the pain, some of the ways that actually work. So go and check out that episode. But basically arthritis is what happens at the end of a life well lived. Like arthritis is all the injuries your horse got in the pasture when they were younger. It is every time your horse walked unbalanced and put more weight on one leg than the other. It's Every time your horse cantered around the round pen on the left lead or on the wrong lead for (laughs) 20, 30 minutes, like that is what arthritis is. It happens, unfortunately. It is extremely common that all horses get arthritis and it's painful. We know that it causes discomfort. It's something humans get. And because it's so common, there's a huge industry of these nutraceuticals and supplements that have been able to be developed and we're willing to buy them. It's Joint supplements are the number one biggest seller for equine supplements. 32% of the market is joint supplements. Again, I think we discussed before, 80% of people who feed supplements feed joint health supplements. So it's a huge part of the market. And research into these ingredients is over 30 years old. Like we've been looking at these ingredients for a while. We kind of know what we need to know. (laughs) It's just that no one's communicating it very clearly. Were you finding that a lot of the research into like the nutraceuticals looked at horses specifically? Or was a lot of it looking at other animals, other species, or looking at humans and then applying it to horses? So a lot of my research is horse specific with with these ingredients. I think just due to um, one of the studies I have, which I'll get to, it started in 1997 with the same ingredients we're using today at the same like ratios. Like a lot of this is old research and old ingredients. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that we haven't really moved, haven't proven they work (laughs) and so we just keep conducting the same experiments over and over hoping that at one point the research will change which I think is a strange concept so it's a lot of um, when you look at other resources or like if for example in smart pack they'll point to human studies and rat studies as well but there's a lot of research into horses and I'll get into why you can't use other species with some of these ingredients you can't I used a couple different sources to do my research Search and just try to get a better understanding of how these ingredients worked. One of them is titled Oral Joint Health Supplements, Chemistry, Pharmacology, and Administration Guidelines. And this was written by Stacey Oak, which I might have a problem with 
with her. I might not. I can't decide. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> but this article was – and I – yeah, she got me. She got me good because I was going through my notes last night and I was like, I've seen this name before and I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt because this is a really good article that goes really in-depth into the different ingredients that are currently on the market. Or not super in-depth, but it, it's a really honest, like, here's what we know look. And this I found on Vetfolio, which Vetfolio is a continuing uh, education website for veterinarians. So they have a lot of really good information that I would highly recommend checking out. There's a lot of free articles you can access. And then I think you probably have to be a vet to do like the courses. But there's a lot of free articles oh, that I cool. thought was cool. And I'd never heard of that website before. So Vetfolio. The other article I used is very similar to the Vetfolio. It's actually, it's written by Jonathan Anderson and David Rendell, who are uh, vets in the UK, and it's called Equine Joint Supplement. So it's pretty much the same sort of format, but it's British vets going through it. And they all kind of have the same conclusions when it comes to looking at this research and what what works. To kick this off, we're going to talk about probably the one ingredient everyone knows when they think about joint health is glucosamine, right? Glucosamine, we hear that one all the time. That's in human supplements. That's in dog supplements, horse supplements. Glucosamine is the joint health secret ingredient. It's actually not secret, but <laughs> it's like the most well-known one, I think. So what is glucosamine? So glucosamine is a water-soluble amino monosaccharide, which basically means it's a simple sugar, and it is the fundamental building blocks for cartilage, specifically joint cartilage. How it works is glucosamine is in the horse's body, and they like make different, different sugar chains in order to build up the cartilage. So it's like that base foundation, kind of how you always hear amino acids, right? They're the building blocks of life because amino acids form proteins, and proteins form muscles. So same thing for glucosamine, it fill, forms cartilage, forms a bunch of chains, and then it forms cartilage. The idea of giving glucosamine in a diet makes sense from the aspect of like, that's how the cartilage gets formed. So if you give more glucosamine, right, the idea is that you could build more cartilage. It's not something that's normally found in a diet, so you don't have like glucosamine rich hay, but obviously like those building blocks in the nutrients needed are there in horses feed so that's why it's added to these dietary supplements because it's something that the body has to produce on its own. So there are three forms of glucosamine that are commercially available. This is important to keep track of. So hydrochloride HCL is going to be the one that you're going to see in your horse supplements. It is kind of one of it's kind of ranks out to be the better one for horses because it has a better absorption rate and it's a little bit more bioavailable than the other forms. The second type is glucosamine sulfate, which is what you're going to see mostly in human and dog studies and dog, human and dog supplements. Again, keep in mind, these are two different forms of glucosamine. So when you're looking at studies, see the problem? Yeah. See the problem? It's two different forms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get And we'll get into it because it does have some big impacts on what that end message is. Last type is N-acetyl-D-glucosamine or NADG. And this one isn't used in order to, or it hasn't been determined to be a very good preventer of cartilage damage. So what has occurred is there have been some studies, which I'll absolutely talk about, where glucosamine has been, is thought of to be preventative. It can't treat the cartilage or the damage caused to the cartilage by arthritis. It can't treat that calcification, but it potentially can prevent further damage. And so glucosamine is often said to be a great preventative. Get your dogs and your horses and your people on glucosamine early to prevent that damage. And I'll explain why that's not quite true. But there are studies that prove that works, but not quite. So basically, these are all salts or sugars. I don't really understand exactly the biochemistry, but they're all salts. Once they get into the stomach, the stomach acid breaks them down and you get glucosamine that is considered a free base. And it is able to be absorbed by the body and sent to its different places and circulated around the body. So the first issue we have with glucosamine, and we probably have this with every ingredient out there, is that its absorption rate is really low. So there's a difference between absorption and bioavailability. If you are feeding 99% pure glucosamine, hydrochloride, the body can only break down 80% of that. If you are feeding glucosamine sulfate, the body can only break down 50 to 60% of that. And this is horse specific. This isn't human, dog, rat, cat. This is horse specific. So they can only use 80%. They can only break down that glucosamine supplement and get 80% of that glucosamine out of the supplement 
that you've provided, uh, and then 50 to 60% out of the glucosamine sulfate. So if you're feeding, and the agreed upon dosage for glucosamine is about 10 grams, 10 to 12 grams of glucosamine hydrochloride. So if you're feeding that, the horse could only break down about 9.6 grams of that. You following? Yeah. So how do you solve that? You just feed more of it? So that way like the 80% is the amount that they actually need to intake? Uh, yes. So you theoretically could feed more. Glucosamine doesn't have a very high toxicity rate. So there have been studies where they've fed a lot more. Unfortunately, glucosamine, not only is it hard to break down, it's also hard to absorb. So in a 2005 study titled Synovial Fluid Levels and Serum Pharmacology kinetics in a large animal model following treatment with oral glucosamine at clinically relevant doses. And basically what it did, and this is one study you're going to see over and over and over, and I believe it was even on SmartPak's website, it proved that glucosamine did get into the animal's synovial fluid, the horse's synovial fluid, and its blood after being fed a 12 gram or 10 to 12 gram dose. But that's all it was able to prove. So in this study, they had eight female horses that were studied. They were fasted overnight and then they were given in week one, they were given 20 milligrams per body weight, which that turns out to be between 10 and 12 grams, the agreed upon dosage. Week one, it was injected intravenously. And then week two, it was intubated in a tube, which is the same thing as giving orally. After it was done, blood samples were collected five minutes, 15, 30, 60, 120, 180, 240, 360, 480, and 720 minutes after dosing. And that synovial fluid and blood were both tested to see how much glucosamine was available. So when you look at these studies, a lot of times they're going to be testing serum or blood serum. Serum means it is the blood minus the part that clots. So any of the proteins that clot are removed and the electrolytes, antibiotics, antigens, hormones, and any external substances are left in that blood. So I'm just saying well, that's what serum is because they don't explain what it is. You have to Google what serum is and it's blood minus the sticky parts. But when they looked at the results, after doing the IV dosing and the oral dosing, they were looking at how many parts per million was glucosamine versus like the liquid they were looking at. So in blood, after IV dosing, the max was 300 parts per million. The oral was six parts per million. Oh. That's a huge difference. So essentially when you give a drug straight into the blood, it is considered 100% bioavailable. So 300 parts was likely the max glucosamine that could have been in the body. Because, right, you just shot it straight into the blood and then you're sampling the blood five minutes later. So, right, like it's exactly how much you just put in. Yeah. And then it breaks down. So where oral, it's not shot straight into the blood. It has to be absorbed. And it was only six parts per million. And then synovial fluid was nine to 15 parts per million when it was IV. And it was 0.3 to 0.7 parts per million when it was oral. Really low <laughs> when it was oral. And it's really interesting if you look at the graph where they compare the eight horses and their levels of glucosamine uh, at the different intervals. When you look at the blood when it was, when it was introduced in, via IV, they really stayed very consistent in their glucosamine levels. But when you looked at the comparison when they had the oral dosing, their levels were all over the place. They weren't really consistent. Horses spiked a little bit after having it and then went back down and they kind of just jumped all around, which I thought was really interesting that the oral, and I think that probably just has to do with your horse's metabolism and how quickly that glucosamine got to certain areas. Because there's a hypothesis as to why glucosamine has such low bio bioavailability does glucosamine build up in the horse's body like it like you know a, no it's water soluble it's water soluble it lasts about 12 hours in the horse's body so if you've ever read your joint supplement you have to feed it twice a day if you're feeding glucosamine you have to feed it twice a day you can't feed it once a day because it only lasts in the body for about 12 hours for the horse now this is really important to note because when you look at human studies human studies show that glucosamine's half-life is 15 hours when we know glucosamine half-life in horses is three hours. So you can't take a human study and say, you can't apply them when your half-life is so drastically different. Yeah. For whatever reason, humans, their metabolism handles glucosamine differently than horses. 
What this study proved, though, is that the bioavailability was about 5.9%. So of that 10 grams, only about 5.9% was being cycled through the horse's body. Bioavailability in pharmacology is the subcategory of absorption and is the fraction of an administered drug that reaches the systematic circulation. So we talked about in the very beginning, they could only break down about 80% of what you're giving them, but then it disappears. <laughs> Glucosamine disappears and only about 5% is left to circulate. So there's another study, a 2004 study, that uh, found similar results, except for they gave the horses 56 grams of glucosamine for their dosing, and their bioavailability was only 2%. 2.5%. So, right, that was your point. Oh, we'll just give them more. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> so this is one of the little mysteries of glucosamine is that it's believed that the liver, kidneys, and intestines are absorbing all of the glucosamine. But nobody knows, no one seemed to really have a good understanding as to why and what that meant. It seems that it's not causing damage, that it's kind to the livers and kidneys and the intestines. And I did see somewhere that maybe glucosamine is a build, like it's also builds the intestinal lining. The theory is because it spends so much time in the intestines, the intestines just absorb it. There are other studies out there, so you will find some conflicting studies where you're gonna see people say, oh yes, it totally works, you know, it's bioavailable, we found it in the urine, we found it in the blood, and then you're gonna see other studies that say, no, we didn't find it in the blood or the urine or the synovial fluid. You're gonna have to look at those studies and look at their dosing. So uh, there was a 2019 study, and this is what's so frustrating. That first study was 2004. In 2019, we're still doing the same studies. <laughs> we haven't proven that it works, we just proved that we can circulate it. But there was a study that was done and they found that there was, glucosamine wasn't getting absorbed at all, but their dosing was like three grams. <laughs> so it was way too low. If you do the math out, like it was way too low to make it to the, to the urine. So. At this point in my research, I was like, let's go to Smart Pack. Like, let's see if we know that you need at least 10 grams to make it to the blood. What are the like going supplements? How much are they offering? So if you want to get a supplement that has a 10 grams of the glucosamine hydrochloride, you're looking at spending about $60. So Cosequin, ASU, and SmartFlex Ultra Pellets both have that 10 grams of uh, glucosamine. The Cosequin one actually has 14 grams of glucosamine per scoop, which is great. If you look at SmartFlex Pellets, that's $40, only has five grams of glucosamine hydrochloride. And Cosequin Equine Powder, $40 per month, and it only has 1.8 grams of glucosamine hydrochloride. Huh. If you want the right amount of these ingredients, you have to understand that that's going to cost you a lot more. A $40 supplement is just filler. Like there's no point in feeding it because you're not even getting the agreed upon dosing. And that's the really, I don't know if you ran into this with your studies. Oh yeah. So the agreed upon dosing is just what one scientist used once and had results. Like, that's how they came up with the 10 to 12. They're like, well, it showed up. We didn't need 56 grams. Or they came up with it by looking at what the humans use in comparison to their body weight and was like, yes, we will then carry this over and use, just, you know, increase it ratio-wise to fit a horse's body weight. Right. And that's the thing is no one's proven, and we're getting to it, guys. I promise. We just started with dosing and absorption. I'm getting to it. But no one's proven these work. So, of course, there's no dosing. <laughs> there's no, like, agreed upon dosing. Right. And no scientific, uh, science behind it because no amount works. <laughs> Sorry. On top of that, though, is if you go and look at the available, the available supplements out there, majority of them, if you're going for one ingredient, you can find a supplement that will give you the correct daily dose for that one ingredient but I can guarantee you, you can't find it that provides the correct dosage for two different ingredients. If like you, yeah. you can only get one at a time. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're going to have to be buying multiple different supplements. Yeah, no, I absolutely played this game this week. And, I was, and Smart Pack does a really awesome job. They have that big table where you can cross-reference and you can say, okay, how much glucosamine if I know I need 10? And then chondroitin sulfate, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. You know that you need about three grams. Can I find a supplement? Okay, so I found like one or two supplements, but the 
cost on one of them was like, oh, that's so much. So I know that product probably actually has the ingredients in it. The other one was so little. The price was so little. I was like, well, you lying. <laughs> like, you don't have it. There's no way. <laughs> there's there's no way. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Is label versus the an- analyzed, which we will also get into because that's a huge problem with supplements is that the label says one thing, but when run through a lab, it turns out to have another thing. Okay, so this was the point in my research where I was like, well, what are the companies saying? What are they pointing out? What do they have? And again, Smart Pack does a really good job of giving you the, uh, the feeling that they've done research and that research is available. So they do have a little research glossary by ingredient and you can click and see what those studies are. But it's all very much like research theater. Here's another scientific word for the day. Do you know the difference between a study that is I don't know how to phrase this. I don't know how to use it in a sentence. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Can you give me the you know origin, the roots of this word? I think the root is probably life or live, but it's vivo No, it's Latin or something, you ding dong. No, it's Latin, but the Latin is probably for live. Like, I think life Yeah, but that's not the root part of, of the word. word. Like, if you ask for the root, you ask the origins, you're like asking language of origins. Oh, I didn't. So vivo versus vitro. Do you know what those are? The difference between those two? No, I have no idea. So an experiment that is in vivo is an experiment that is conducted within the living organism. So for example, if I drank a gallon of water a day and we tracked it and that was the experiment, that would be an in vivo experiment. I was the living organism. The experiment happened within the living organism. No. Vitro is when the experiment happens outside of the living organism. So that would be taking a slice of my heart and adding a gallon of water to it and going, yep, good things happen. Or, oh, no, that's not right. No, 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 no. I don't like the way this is going. No, no, no. This isn't even the bad part. Oh, no. Y'all, there's bad parts in this episode too like it, oh it gets dark this isn't the part they promised that these horses died for other reasons robin not related to these studies uh, i still don't like it yeah because not all my studies made that promise oh oh, oh. oh god oh god no 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 yeah so this is the good one where they promised the horses died for other reasons. So what they did in this study, so this is a 2008 study titled The Effects of Clinically Relevant Concentrations of Glucosamine on Equine Chondroitin, Chondroitocytes, Chondroitocytes, and Synoviocytes. Basically, chondroitocytes means uh, cartilage, cartilage cells, and synovocytes is synovial cells. I don't know why they got to be fancy like that. So this was a study that was on SmartPak's uh, webpage, and I found this study on my own as well. Basically, what they did is they took sample cartilage from eight horses, put them in their little Petri dishes that had arthritis, so arthritis samples. Or no, wait, shoosh. I think these ones were the ones where the, sorry, there's a, this study's been done a lot. In this study, they uh, were considered healthy cartilage samples, they destroyed them and then added glucosamine and then added a compound to try to destroy them again. So they had a couple different samples. And what they're trying to see, and this is where the belief that glucosamine will prevent uh, further damage comes from, because in these vitro studies, glucosamine, when added to the little slice of cartilage, did stop further um, simulated Per, uh, basically a simulation of their body breaking down, right? So they added a compound, a simulated compound to try to destroy the cartilage and the glucosamine was able to offer a buffer and prevent that damage. Of course, this is not very reflective of what's happening in the animal for multiple reasons. You applied straight glucosamine straight to the cartilage <laughs> And it did something. Also, the study provided glucosamine at a rate that was much for, much above the agreed upon dose. Was that they used way more glucosamine in this study than would have been available orally to a horse, would have been then absorbed, and then would have been bioavailable. The point being is, yes, you prevented damage. And this is what we're hanging our hats on. But this study was in vitro and at a much higher dosing than your horse will ever get or you will ever like that you will ever be able to get into your horse's cartilage and joints yeah it's not applicable it's not applicable yes something happened in a petri dish but it's not applicable so yeah there is some belief that like so this is where glucosamine being preventative comes from 
So some of the other issues with those smart pack studies that they identified, one of them was that they were using uh, human studies. And the issue with humans, as I pointed out, is human studies are looking at glucosamine sulfate, which we know is less, like the horse uses that, utilizes that one even less than they utilize glucosamine um, hydrochloride. So we know that a glucosamine sulfate, its absorption or its breakdown rate is about uh, 50 to 60 percent. In humans and dogs and rats, the breakdown is 95 percent. So they can break down and make 95 percent of glucosamine sulfate bioavailable. Why humans can do it so much better than horses, I don't know. Um, but just because you can get 95% of it to circulate does not mean it's doing anything. But I guess maybe, like, I guess if you can get that much more versus a horse that can get 5%, is 95% enough that glucosamine could be? I mean, it's certainly an improvement. It's certainly an improvement. So I don't, I don't really know the answer to that one. So that's where I'm going to leave glucosamine for a second. And I'm going to pop over and start talking about chondroitin sulfate. And I'm going to say that word wrong a hondred times, so I apologize. So the reason I chose chondroitin sulfate is because for some reason, some unknown reason, and again, like there's still so many questions after 30 years of research, and you see that we just keep trying to prove that we can absorb glucosamine and horses can absorb glucosamine, but we don't move beyond that for whatever reason, that when you have a supplement that has both glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, something happens and it's good. But that's kind of as much as we know. <laughs> so if you do want a supplement, it has to have chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine and at the proper dosing. And check out the price tag because it's going to be expensive because chondroitin sulfate is very difficult to synthesize and extract. And because of that is one of the most expensive ingredients and it is rarely used alone. So you're always going to see other ingredients because it just is so expensive. So if you're looking at a supplement that has a good amount of chondroitin sulfate in it and it's cheap, that's probably a red flag. What's the daily dose recommended for that? So this is a weird one. Um, <laughs> because it's so expensive, you're not going to find the recommended dose in a supplement. So the recommended dose is 0.36 grams, somewhere between 3 and 4 grams. However, and I can confirm this looking at Smart Pack, you're only going to get between 0.5 and uh, 2.4 grams in a supplement. I did not see a supplement that went over 2.5 grams. Is it still effective then in the lower? So yeah, so I'm going to, so you're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but yes. So I'm just so smart. <laughs> so it is something the horses can break down and use a little bit better. Its bioavailability rate is 22 to 30 percent. So you need it. You don't need it. So that's why the dose is smaller. So that that that's the only reason. You only need three gram, three to four grams because the bioavailability is better. But 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 there's a catch to that. You have to be using chondroitin sulfate A4 or the low molecular weight. Guys, how do you know which one's in your container? I don't know if my chondroitin sulfate's the lower molecular weight or the higher molecular weight one. I don't know. So what is chondroitin sulfate? Why is it so good? So basically chondroitin sulfate is what makes synovial fluid slippery. Ooh. <laughs> so it is like, it's got a lot of viscosity to it and it's got a unique like resilience to it. So it gives cartilage its bounciness. So if <laughs> most of you probably have never played with cartilage, but like if you ever find it like in your chicken, I don't know, like there's, it has play to it and that is uh, that unique property of being able to squish it is the chondroitin sulfate. When uh, you use chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine together, somehow it does something good for the synovial fluid. It makes it slipperier. So there are quite a few studies. When you look through the available research, you're going to see glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate often together in those experiments, and they're often going to be looking at the bioavailability of those two. So a 2006 study, I did find this one on Smart Pack, and I actually am intrigued by this one. This one does interest me, and no horses had to die for this, so that was fantastic. It is called the Effects of Oral Glucosamine and Chondroitin Sulfate Supplements on Frequency of Interarticular Therapy of the Horse's Hawks. So this was conducted uh, by a veterinarian herself. She kind of did like a field study for eight years with these horses. Uh, Martha R. Rogers is her name. She worked as a vet uh, 
with hunter jumpers and eventers at one barn under one trainer and she was giving them annual hawk injections and this started this experiment started in 1997 so that's how long these ingredients have been out there and been being researched and she decided what if we put these horses these 10 horses but she said why don't we put them on this supplement this chondroitin glucosamine combination and see what happens and if we can't reduce at a minimum the amount of hawk injections your horses are getting. So the oral supplement they were given, and of course I don't have a brand name or anything like that, but she did say it had 7.8 grams of glucosamine and 2.4 grams of chondroitin. But that was their active ingredient ingredients and that was given, was given twice a day, so that amount split up. So she gave, that's the supplement again, this study took place over like an eight-year period it took seven to ten months for results to start oh wow or sorry excuse me six to eight months for the results to start to see an improvement that's still drastic yeah so when you see a study that says we did it for 14 days or 28 days or you know i didn't see many studies that were longer than 28 days 28 days was the longest and there's a reason these studies are expensive so to someone who is able to do this Yes, this was a, like in the field, a clinical kind of study, but I think this is important. This is still an important, important information. And I think it's so important to know that it took six to eight months for all those horses to show an improvement. So if you try to supplement for 14 days or 30 days and saw no results, it takes a while. And that is likely, honestly, going to be due to that chondroitin sulfate because that's the one that like bio, it, like accumulates in the body and it can take a few months before you start to feel the effects of it. Okay, that would make sense, I suppose. So the horse's hawk injections throughout this study were reduced from every seven months to every 10 months. So they were able to reduce the number of injections. But that, I mean, that was the conclusion of the study. Like how applicable that is to the rest of the world, I don't know. Hawk injections are kind of subjective. There is no standard. There is no test. It's not a pass fail before your horse needs a hawk injection. It really is when you feel ready for it or when you feel like your horse has gotten worse. So how much of that would be the placebo effect? I don't know. But I did think that study was an interesting one. I liked the format of it. I liked that it started back in the 90s. Um, and it was one that was on Smart Pack. But like, it doesn't really answer a ton of questions. Yeah, I do like the longevity, though, of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's super important if we're thinking that these supplements are going to have any long term effect. Like that's right. The idea is to be preventative or to help manage pain. 28 days is not really enough to determine that. Well, and at least though, the way that that study shows, that, or at least what I'm taking away from it, is that the horse's body didn't necessarily build up a tolerance to the supplement itself. It didn't become ineffective, that they are able to keep its effectiveness throughout the entire however many years it was going for. Yeah, yeah. And I would imagine the horses stayed on the supplement. Um, she did say, and I unfortunately she didn't have enough raw data, but she did say the horses that got the supplements or the injections most frequently ended up being the horses that then got the bigger intervals later after the injection. So I thought that was really, in, like, that's interesting, but I didn't have any raw data. Like, she didn't give me tables to, like, look at horse one and horse two and, like, kind of compare them in that way. She just gave, like, a summary. Yeah. And it took, again, I should point out, like, it did take a while to get there. It didn't happen in year one. You really didn't see the big difference until, I think, like, year three or four. And by then, most people give up on their supplements. Right, yeah. How many of us are going to like cross our fingers for four years and hope something happens? No, no one's going to do that. It's food for thought on that one. Yeah, I think it, I think there's something to that ingredient. I think there's a possibility if at, at the end of the day, if you are going to, you feel you need to give your horse a supplement, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, those are got to be your key ingredients. There's like one or two supplements on the market that do that. That's kind of my quick overview of those ingredients. Guys, this episode is far from over. I have many more issues with these ingredients um, that we're going to get into, but I just want to touch real quickly on a couple of the other ingredients you're going to see often on the back of your supplement containers. The first one is MSM, which is like a derivative of DMSO. It is basically a sulfur compound. So once upon a time, a test was done or study was done on mice. They fed them a bunch of MSM and it reduced their inflammation. And since that day, everyone was like, MSM, you've got to have it. There, there's no further research. <laughs> and I don't think any research has ever been done on MSM in horses. 
We all swear by it. Like this is one of those supplements that I actually swear works, but for a totally different reason. I use it as a digestive aid for horses that are like, should be getting enough calories, but just can't like get that final 50 pounds on. For some reason you feed them MSM and I feel like they can digest their food a little bit better. I'm probably crazy. I probably just like ended up feeding my horses more food. But, (laughs) and this is one of those ingredients that isn't technically permitted to be put into horse feed if you'll remember from our first episode but everyone just agrees it's safe and goes like i might as like you might as well put it in like we're not gonna stop you but like it's not approved it's not an approved ingredient the next one you're gonna see that's becoming really popular is avocado soybean unsaponifiable extracts so this is an ingredient that has actually been tested in humans for about 10 years and has shown good results with humans in again limited studies and for because of that was then taken over into the horse world and this is one that maybe is helpful where it has shown that it did not reduce i think like one experiment was done it did not reduce the lameness but it did show that maybe their synovial fluid was like the production was increased so this is one that maybe has some benefits or something but further research needs to be done what i was reading on that one was that it wasn't applicable to horses okay that's interesting that's interesting i didn't dig super deep into it because i didn't have the time um because like i said i've got more complaints i'm not done with my complaint list yeah i didn't i didn't dig super far into it it just popped up when i was looking into natural ingredients and stuff and i came across that that was one of them that talked about how you can't apply human results in other species whether it's like a guinea pig a cat or dog you can't apply it to a horse it's not Their systems are not the same. Their systems do not break things down. So what I was finding was it was not as applicable in horses to use for an anti-inflammatory or like against cartilage breakdown. Okay. And that's the other thing that we should keep in mind is that a lot of these drugs, not a lot of these drugs, but some of these have anti-inflammatory properties, which is pain reduction. And there's a difference between pain management and like rebuilding your cartilage like those are two different things um and so it's kind of important to keep that in mind that you may see improvements but that could be a pain related improvement not that the horse is any sounder not that the horse's cartilage is any healthier the last ingredient that you're going to see on a lot of supplement containers is hyaluronic acid so this has been around for about 40 years and has shown great success as an interjoint or intrajoint injection hyaluronic acid does help when injected straight into the joints does nothing when ingested so it's great that it's added most products have about like a gram of it but it doesn't do anything when ingested you have to and that's the thing like arthritis is something that the pain can be managed it's not going to be managed through oral supplements you have to actually do real vet procedures real injections, real therapies to see a difference, and they're not cheap. There are ways, it's just not oral supplements. So my next beef, because I don't even know how this came thought came to me, but I think I was just sitting there and I realized both of those ingredients I had talked about, cocosamine and chondroitin sulfate, aren't found in plants. How are they getting into the supplement? What is in my supplement. Where? What is the source of these ingredients? Oh. Any guesses, Robin? No. No, I don't. No, I really, really don't. So <laughs> I was able to stumble across like quite a few articles that like this is kind of well known is like omega-3s and fish oils are causing like a huge sort of issue globally with overfishing in order to get these oils for supplements when you can get omega-3s and fish oils in other places. So there's lots of information about that. There is very little. The only place I was able to find information about any of these joint ingredients was in literature, scientific research with studies trying to look at alternative sources because the current sources are slaughter byproducts and marine animals no that's what i was afraid of yeah 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 yeah. no so it's it's 
It's great. It's great. Um, so, so glucosamine can be found in like shells of shellfish and animal bones, bone marrow, and fungi. Like there's a couple different sources fungi? for glucosamine. Glucosamine. You mean fungi, ding dong? You can say fungi. I'm pretty sure you can say fungi. <laughs> I don't think you can. Shut up. Go away. <laughs> Go away. But anyways, so it is found in basically slaughter byproducts, a lot of these ingredients, including the cartilage. So um, a lot of like... Cow ears, pig ears, no. nasal passages. Nasal passages are big. No. Um, <laughs> shark fins and shark rays, or ray, ray fins, like the rays, those big, what are they called? Those big ray animals, right? What's the animal Sting called? Rays? Is it a ray? Stingray. Stingray. <laughs> Sharks and stingrays have the purest form of a lot of these ingredients, like chondroitin, uh, hyaluronic acid. So sharks are being harvested for these products. Now, I am not going to by any means say that there's shark in your joint supplement. There probably is not. Shark, because it's the purest form and most expensive for chondroitin sulfate, is likely gonna be in, the, in cosmetics because the cosmeceutical industry is huge. We all, the hyaluronic acid serums, like there's all kinds of serums and paste. I'm guessing that's where the good stuff's going. I'm guessing that's where the sharks and the rays are. Your supplements probably have cow cartilage and rooster goblets, in, like the rooster beards in them because it's a lower quality and you can get a, a larger amount of no, it. No, stop it. Stop telling me this. That means your horse supplements aren't getting the best quality. So I did find a 2013 literature review looking at chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, chitin, chitosan production using marine waste um, and trying to find alternative care um, applications. So alternative ways. So yes, there is some lab production, but from what I understand, that lab production has to start with the cells of a fish. Uh, apparently salmon nasal cartilage is a good source, which seems oddly specific and like a really tiny, tiny source. So there is a bunch of like, you take it, you get the bio, the marine waste, and then you ferment it and you make all these chains and then you get the product. I don't understand the science behind all of it, but it is, they're, they are looking at options. But yeah, shark fins have been commonly used. They're one of the biggest sources of that chondroitin sulfate, which makes them, that ingredient astronomical, <laughs> like a huge price. Uh, and that means that rays and sharks have been overfished for for your supplements, for human supplements, for dog supplements, for horse supplements. So that's something really fun to think about. In India, they are trying to figure out if cow, uh, specifically buffaloes, if you can use the tracheal uh, cartilage, nasal cartilage, and joint cartilages, if that's a better alternative to sharks. They're finding it about like 60% pure. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I ever wanted to know this. I think I like ignorance better on this front. Right? And that's like the thing is that you have to keep in mind like, okay, so my product probably doesn't have shark in it, which means I'm not getting the best product. It could have fish eyeballs. That's another one. Fish eyeballs. <laughs> no. No, go away. But what was crazy was I could only find this information looking at studies. So there are lots of studies, uh, scientific research, where they're trying to find alternative sources and trying to find more economical, uh, more sustainable methods of sourcing these products. But there's no like articles on this. No, I tried to look at several joint, uh, several supplement companies, their websites, because I was like, where are you getting your stuff? I want to know before I buy your product, tell me where you're getting your ingredients. No, there's nothing of that nature. Like you can't find that. <clears throat> the last one um, I'll tell you about sourcing wise is Duralactin. So that is a very specific product. That is the product name. Uh, there's like a horse version, a human version, a dog version. I was recommended to give this to my horse by my vet. I bought it. It's expensive. My horse had a meltdown when I tried to feed this to him. And I was like, okay, that's that's something. <laughs> um, like my horse, full panic attack, knocked his grain bucket everywhere. He, he's got a tiny little scoop of Duralactin, like panicked at his food. And I like, I don't know where else what other episode to put this information in. So I'm putting it here. Duralactin is an anti-inflammatory. So it was recommended to my, me by my vet to help with my horse's uh, arthritis and the swelling in his knees. What it is, it is basically cows that have been hyper immunized uh, and then are milked and that milk uh, and colostrum goes into this supplement. How do you hyper immunize a cow? 
there's two different ways to do this. So one way, which comes out of Thailand, thanks Thailand, is you inject the cow with a basically every known illness and virus. They inject them. It's like a 26-way uh, injection, and it basically makes the cow's immune system go crazy. And then you take the milk and the colostrum. No. I don't think that one's as bad as how Duralactin does it, because that's not how Duralactin does it. Because Duralactin, and this comes from their website, unfortunately, I only know one way to do this. If there's a scientist out there, a medical profession that knows another way to do this, let me know. What they are promising is neutrophils. So neutrophils are a very specific type of white blood cell that helps the immune system break down like inflammation and foreign cells within the body. So white blood cells, neutrophils are produced by the body's bone marrow. To get the cow to have extra neutrophils, extra white blood cells, the cow is given an injection that basically causes its bone marrow to go into overdrive. This is extremely painful. The only reason I know it's extremely painful is because the same injection is given to leukemia patients because they leukemia is a blood cancer. Mm. It is extremely painful because your bones feel like they're growing. Remember Harry Potter when he had to regrow his arm? Yes, your whole body is having to do that. Oh my God. So imagine cows... <laughs> having that shot, that injection. I could not confirm how they get hyperimmunized cows with extra neutrophils. I could not confirm how they're doing that, but that's the only way I know. Oh, that's horrible. And again, that's still not the worst part. No. So <laughs> before I hand... I'm done. I tap out. We're not even done yet. Like, okay. So before I hand it over to you, because you've got some ingredients you want to talk about too, because guys, there's obviously so many ingredients that we could There's be no way I it. can follow this up. Oh my gosh. Well, maybe we can put yours in a special episode, like a bonus natural ingredients episode. Because, Robin, I haven't even hit you with the hard one yet. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to save myself for a different day. But, oh gosh, this is all so horrible. I, I don't even know what to say. Finish off with whatever other horror stories you have to tell us. Okay, so the last little piece that I have is the guaranteed versus analyzed issue. So this is something that we probably have all heard about from one time or another. There's a rumor out there that this study was done, maybe it was done about 10 years ago, like 2004 five feels like right and what they did was they took 15 joint supplements that were on the market at that time and they said the label promises promises this meant much of the ingredients and when we analyze it in the lab we find that oh they they lied that we don't have anywhere near what they said and i always thought like that was really embarrassing for those companies good thing they found out and fixed that <laughs> yeah no they they didn't do that so so one of the most recent ones I found was from 2016, and this is the efficacy of equine oral joint supplements. This was presented at the Bright Ideas Conference at Stephen F. Austin University. Uh, basically, they analyzed six different joint supplements. I don't know what names, what brands they used. They looked at their uh, hyaluronic acid uh, promises, first they're analyzed, the chondroitin sulfate, and the glucosamine. So I'll just give you a couple quick examples so you guys understand. So for supplement A, actually for all of the supplements that had uh, hyaluronic acid in it, they all promised like one gram of hyaluronic acid and then would deliver with like 22 grams. <laughs> like, okay. Or uh, they would do, and this was a uh, milligram, sorry, let me just break down how they did their math. So this is milligrams per gram. So per gram, there was supposed to be one gram of hyaluronic acid and there was 22 grams. That same supplement was supposed to have 29 milligrams of chondroitin sulfate, but only had 16. It was supposed to have 88 milligrams of glucosamine, only had seven. We know hyaluronic acid does nothing, so giving us extra is great. It's filler. The chondroitin is what we know we need, <laughs> and you only gave us like half, and you were supposed to give us 88 milligrams and you gave us seven. One of these supplements, supplement D, someone is getting fired because they were supposed to provide one gram of hyaluronic acid, but the test didn't pick up any. Uh, they were supposed to provide 73 milligrams of chondroitin sulfate, provided 156 milligrams. Somebody's getting fired. That is like <laughs> twice the amount they're supposed to provide. And that's super expensive if you're using good stuff. What? But don't worry, they're supposed to provide 176 milligrams of glucosamine and provided three. 
thinking someone got their fats mislabeled or something. The problem is study after study has found issues with the supplements not meeting their label. So even if we figured out and we all agreed that that's the right dosing, no guarantee unless you test every single supplement that that's even in there. Because remember, these aren't regulated. <laughs> these are a free for all. So that's where I'm going to leave my part for now. I have a ton of conclusion thoughts because there's still more issues with this industry. But if you want to jump in and do natural or I don't know how you want to work this because I told you I told you it was a long episode. Uh, I <laughs> I think honestly, we can probably just save my stuff on natural ingredients for a different day because I really only dug into one ingredient, which was devil's claw. But this has already been like such a heavy and dense episode to have to digest all that information and also process the horrors that you've told us so far. And I know you're not even done yet, which is probably the worst part of it all. Yeah. So this is the part of the episode where we usually say, oh, there's a lot of questions. We'd like the research to continue. And this is the time this I'm going to take a little bit different approach. I would really like the research to stop until we can find a better way to do this. Go ahead and Google the phrase, pop it into uh, your Google Scholar, experimentally induced arthritis. No. There are dozens and dozens of studies conducted on horses, dogs, rats, where they are perfectly healthy animals that are destroyed for the test. So what they do, and I understand, like I get the thought process. The thought process is we want to reduce as many variables as possible. We want a healthy horse otherwise. We want everyone to have similar arthritis in the same area, easy to monitor, same age. I get the thought process. The problem is what they do in a Oftentimes, for example, we'll talk about the knee joint of doing it in horses. They surgically open up the knee joint and it's called osteochondral fragmentation. Basically, you chip, break, and damage the joint bones so that it has to, the bones have to heal, causing arthritis. The other horses, and this isn't just one or two horses. This is some of the studies have 10, some have 6, some have 12. I, the, it's not massive amounts of groups, but it's dozens and dozens of studies. Those horses that are in the control group also go underneath and go through an operation, but it's a sham operation. So they just open up the knee, look around and close it back up. In horses or in rats, they're injected. Their joints are injected. So they get arthritis because no one's going to do a little uh, knee surgery on a rat. And not that that isn't adorable. Just the thought of doing knee surgery on a rat is adorable. Just not like injuring the rat for your study. Yeah. (laughs) But there are tons of studies that we're looking at that are, and I avoided using them in this episode, but you will find experimentally induced, enter word here. I found one that was looking at supplements and their impact on the horse's tendons. The horses were went through surgery to have their deep digital flexor tendon injured. They were then fed the supplement for six weeks and then their tendons were removed to be studied. No. Yeah. So I'm going to again ask that we either figure out a better way to do this research or we stop. We don't have any proof it's working. I think this industry is causing more harm than good at this point. And it, it's enough. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like that. Like, I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> it's enough. We've been studying this for 30 years and we still haven't proved that any of this stuff works. So stop, please. Good Lord, stop. The last little conclusion thought that I want to leave you with, um, and this is why I can't remember if I, I can't decide if I hate Stacey L. Oak or not, comes from our vet's perspective. So I understand how capitalism works. I understand that everyone's got to bring home money. But the AAEP, which is what American Association of Equine Practitioners, they at their 2010 conference, and I'm sure it's happened at other times, had a presentation that was done by Stacy, who works for Classiquin, that was all about how vets need to sell, sell, sell. That they are missing out on the proverbial golden opportunity by not selling ju- supplements directly to clients, specifically oral joint supplements to clients. That this is a million, actually was $2 billion industry, and that vets were only getting 11% of that industry. 
and that, that needed to be increased. So what I found was that like her notes from that lecture, it was published in their annual convention uh, magazine, briefly, briefly goes over the lack of research and says that just use your evidence-based medical approach. Just go with your gut when giving these supplements and glosses over the fact that these supplements don't work and was pushing the vets to sell. And I get that's how this works. Like I'm not so naive. I'm just, vets aren't professionals on this topic. They have not spent the time doing the research and I'm not saying I'm a professional at all, but that's, they want to help you. They're not recommending these products so that your horse doesn't get better, but you have to keep it in mind that they are getting pressure from the companies to sell. The vets are getting pressure from the companies to sell. So yes, both my vets have recommended my horses be on clinical or clinical, be on joint supplements. Neither one, I did not have to purchase joint supplements from my vets. They did not do that at all. Um, I know one of them for sure sells platinum performance, but I don't know if the other one does. But regardless, like there's so many, my vets may be great about it, but I don't know about your vet or vets in the Midwest or in other locations that are being told by their organization that they need to be selling and there's no research to back it up. And it's being glossed over that there's no research. I'm sorry. I'm still stuck on the whole causing arthritis in horses' knees things and like removing their tendons. Yeah, so you do realize that uh, you don't you don't put the tendon back once it's removed. You, you do. you do. I know that, which just makes it so, oh my gosh, I'm just so horrified by that. Just to see if the, and it's like, how can we not, like, I understand tendons are super fragile. Like, I totally get tendons are super fragile. And you can't, it's not like, I feel like our, cartilage and bone you can actually take little pieces of not that it's great but you can you can't just take a chunk of tendon and like let the horse live like I get that that doesn't work out but it's just it's crazy (laughs) to me that this like industry exists like this I think what's even not like what's even nuttier is I would never be aware of it until this episode and so we started digging into it like this right like the whole sourcing issue was me going like just me thinking huh, where did they get this then? Like just me having a question, like there's no literature on it. Like there's no, like no one's talking about that except for in the scientific research. Like that to me is a huge, like that that bothers me. Like that's something like, I like, where are you getting this? <laughs> like how is it getting into my containers? Yeah, and like the cherry picking of information that they present in these different studies to like skew it in their favor is just Ah, it just grates on my nerves. Well, and the fact that we've been doing the same experiments over and over. Why are we doing the same experiment in 2019 that we did in 2005? That's the best we could come up with. Right. I was finding that with the natural ingredients too. I also found it really frustrating that most of the studies I was finding, it was really hard to find one that looks specifically at a singular ingredient. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you ran into this at all, but most of them were looking at a blend or it in conjunction sure. with another ingredient. That's great, but how does this singular ingredient in concentrated doses affect? Like, how does that work? But no one looks specifically at one. In fact, one of them, they had like a blend that actually included horsetail in it. And I was like, hold up. I'm sorry. I think I went through a pony club lesson once upon a time that taught me that's toxic to our horses. (laughs) Why are we putting this in a supplement? And that's the thing is, remember, this is an unregulated industry. That's it. They could do whatever they want. (laughs) They have to. You have to be able to prove that you've been hurt and been affected by these products before the (laughs) Department of Agriculture will look into them. That's why we did that part one to like explain how this industry works so that you understand like and look I both I had two horses on joint supplements I am like so nervous for the next vet appointment and I have to be like yeah so no my horses don't get joint supplements anymore because the thing is it I mean if it's not causing any harm to my horse why why shouldn't I give it right like why why not give it if it's not going to cause any harm like it could do something good and it's just I have the money to spend so why not do it and it's just there's so many questions with this industry that like I don't know honestly I've started off opposed to the supplement industry never been a big fan never really been invested in it at all and I think all of this has just made me even that much more opposed I don't know what I'm going to do when Trin comes down with arthritis and stuff I have no idea what I'm going to do there 
there, but till then, I don't need to figure out the answer. And that's what like, and that was my point is I'm coming at it from the person who has spent hundreds of dollars a month on supplements. Like I am the person that I don't believe in them. But when someone like gives me a good sales pitch or when it comes from my vet, like again, we don't buy these because we're trying to hurt our horses. We buy these because we want to do the best for our horses and we want to help them. And it's like so hard to like the lab- the packages work. They're pretty. They're shiny. Everyone else is giving it. Your vet's recommending it. Like, right? Like you're the crazy one for questioning it. It's just presented as such a norm. Yeah, it's totally a norm. A norm. And the reason is because arthritis is normal. Everybody gets arthritis. And because everybody, horses, dogs, cats, humans, get arthritis, there's a huge industry. It's unavoidable. Arthritis is unavoidable, unfortunately. There's ways to manage it and deal with it, but it's expensive. You know, there are eye wraps and there's a whole bunch of different, you know, platelet-rich plasmas and conditioned serums and a whole bunch of take the blood out, shake it up a little bit, put it back in. Like there's a bunch of those things you can do that have shown good results for helping make your horses more comfortable with arthritis but that comes with a five thousand dollars a fifteen hundred dollar price tag you know it's yeah super expensive and you have to find a vet that's willing to do that and that might mean hauling your horse to a hospital or to a university if you're somewhere you know rural you don't have access to these options so i get it and I like I'm trying to figure out what I do like the only thing I can figure out right now is that I think we're gonna have to go to prescription drugs but then that comes with its own like issues like <laughs> giving your horse you know Prevacox or Equinox each day is a whole other set of issues but at least that's a drug and it's regulated and I know the dosing's accurate and I know it works because they had to actually prove that so like there's at least some guarantees that prescriptions are better you're stuck between a rock and a drugged place yeah so that is uh joint supplements all right well on that happy note happy ending hopefully everyone else is just as jubilant as we are to have discovered the horrors of the supplement industry thank you i guess for listening i'm sorry i'm so sorry you had to find out the horrors because i'm still reeling over here Thank you for listening to this episode. If you guys have questions, comments, concerns, reach out to us on Instagram at inthebarn.pod. Comment on our post. Get a conversation going in the comments because I promise we really actually want to hear you guys' feedback. I wish we had a better way to hear your feedback directly and stuff, but we do read everything because we don't get anything. So we read all of the nothing that we receive. (laughs) (laughs) Just reach out. We'll hit you up. (laughs) No, we have people comment. People say thanks. Um... And I did start a Facebook page, but I realized that um, I'm now officially an old person and I have no idea how (laughs) these group webpage Facebook thingies work. And I have no idea how to make anything pop up because I swear I've posted, but I don't know how to see that I've posted. And so I don't know if you could see. Do you see what I see? Is there anything on the page? I've seen, I I think I've seen one or two of your posts. I liked him. I like them. And I think I'm following us. I can't guarantee it. Thank you. Thank you. Because I don't know. I can't see any of that. I have no idea. When I look at it, I just get a blank page. Like, that's all I get. And I know I'm doing something wrong. I'm sure of it. (laughs) I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. All right, guys. Thank you once again so much for listening. And remember to stay safe, stay classy, and stay in the saddle. 